All right, guys, welcome back to Skeptics, episode 13. The next week marks the return of my co-hosts, so I figured I'd take this week to talk about something that I have a little something to say about. It probably wouldn't make a very good three-way conversation, so I'll do this one on my own. And uh, before we get started, just a couple of reminders. We now have a Patreon set up, patreon.com slash skeptics. Also, if you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel, go ahead and subscribe if you enjoy these kinds of videos. And uh, like this video if, if this one suits you. And click the little notifications button if you'd like to be notified when we publish new content. All right, so that out of the way. Uh, what I want to talk about today is something called Manuscript 512. It's a document that is in the National Library of Brazil at Rio de Janeiro. And um, it, they've published uh, really high-definition scans of this document online in PDF form. So you can go take a look at it. It's, it's pretty fascinating. But in the form that it currently exists, it is, it's a few pages in a bound book. And these pages have some significant damage from, you know, some sort of worm or something beat at the pages. Um, but what is detailed on these pages is basically the findings of a field exploration that probably occurred in 1753. Um, this document was first brought to light when it was kind of like rediscovered amongst the archives of the National Library in 1839. Um, the few things we know about it are that the version that is written into this bound book is a transcription of whatever the original writing was. And the original writing appears to have been a personal letter um, from one person to another, communicating these field findings and basically inviting the person receiving the letter to come take advantage of some of the potential treasure that was to be had. So seemingly at some point in the years after it was written, someone saw fit to copy this letter down um, into a bound book uh, with a foreword, essentially, that kind of gives some context as to where it came from. And that foreword basically says that the document describes a journey undertaken in 1753 by a group of people that had been kind of meandering in the wilderness of eastern brazil for 10 years and this was something they happened upon and uh they wrote it up sent it out and th that letter arrived in rio de janeiro in 1754 that's kind of what the foreword describes so if those details are accurate then the person that the captain of the party was writing to lived in rio de janeiro now it's interesting because the circumstances under which he sent this letter to his friend in Rio uh, were kind of cloak and dagger. He mentions in the end of the letter, he says, I'm sending this to you by way of a messenger, and this messenger is going to conduct you to the place where we found these things because we don't want it getting out um, because the place would become overrun with people probably seeking riches. So he's going to deliver you this letter and then he's going to show you the place. Now, interestingly, the author of the letter says that he and his party are camped out at the convergence of the Paraguasu and Una rivers. And if he were trying to keep the location of his findings a secret, so secretive that he couldn't put the location in the letter for fear of it falling into someone else's hands, then there are conceivably only two reasons he would put the location of his campsite into the letter, and that is that he's writing about a finding that he made a long time ago, and his campsite at the Paraguasu and Una rivers is far removed from that location, or it is a mislead so that anyone who does find themselves in possession of the letter would have basically a false starting point to begin looking for uh, the things that he describes in the letter. Now, I only bring that up because most people who have read this document, they take this mention of the location of his campsite as an indication to where the lost city is or where it is nearby. And because of that, people pretty exclusively look in 
Bahia in Brazil, which is one of the northeastern states of the country of Brazil. Uh, because that river junction is in the state of Bahia, people kind of confine their search to to that area. Um, now, again, either he was lying about where he was or he was so far removed from the location of the findings that it was safe for him to include the location of his campsite. Um, it is pretty safe to say that they were in eastern Brazil, though, because they were they were not in the Amazon rainforest. They were not in the far south of Brazil. Uh, they were they were almost certainly in eastern Brazil. Okay, now since the letter was discovered, or I suppose rediscovered in the archives of the National Library of Brazil in 1839. There have been two slash three major translations of this document performed, and uh, they are all of varying levels of um, accuracy. The very earliest one was done in 1869, so 30 years after its rediscovery, by Isabel Burton. Now, Isabel Burton was the wife of Richard Francis Burton, the explorer. She herself was... A linguist and an explorer and really a cool person and uh she made a translation of the manuscript 512 document that was like pretty dang good like it had some errors oh i should say portuguese is my second language so um in reading the manuscript itself and comparing it to translations um i've found that isabel burton's translation pretty good um and then in, I think in the forties, so like a little more than 70 years after her translation, a guy named Harold Wilkins published a new translation. And this translation was far inferior to Isabel Burton's. It was like, it got some of the main points right, I suppose, but there were things in it that were like, where did you even come up with that? Like there were things that he certainly like not knowing what the translation was or being unable to read the handwriting he went ahead and inserted something that he probably had less than 50 percent certainty of and uh just cooked up something that does not match the the text itself uh so harold wilkins translation is bad the third translation that exists of manuscript 512 is basically a direct ripoff of Harold Wilkins' translation. Now, Harold Wilkins, again, very clear that the guy doesn't speak Portuguese, didn't put a lot of effort into, like, actually transcribing and translating the document, did kind of, like, a minimal thing, departed from certain accuracies of Isabel Burton's translation by a pretty wide margin, so I think he probably didn't reference that one at all. And... Uh, yeah, the latest translation by an author that I'm not going to name um, is just a blatant plagiarism of Harold Wilkins' translation with a few flourishes added. And the reason that I know it's a plagiarism is because one of the like glaring mistakes in Wilkins' translation, a mistake that would be impossible for two different people to make because it is so far off the mark. It's not even a mistake. It doesn't even sort of translate the corresponding sentences in the text. It's this wild invention based on being able to identify one or two words. And that exact word for word horrible invention is found in that newer translation as well. So it's very clear to me that this man did not make his own translation. I emailed him about it and I was like, hey dude, <laughs> like you got to stop saying you translated this because clearly you took this whole thing from Wilkins and added a few adjectives that sounded poetic to you and he vehemently denied that but you know what are you going to do when you play dress up you're going to deny it and being thoroughly unsatisfied with the translations that exist and a little asterisk there would be Isabel Burton's is pretty good she did this in 1839, and she managed to translate a lot of it very accurately. Hers was the only, like, noble effort at all. Um, but it still, like, had some mistakes that were not her fault. Just information she didn't have access to, I'm sure. But because no very good translation exists, I decided to make my own. So I spent, like, a month meticulously, like, 
transcribing and translating this document. This document was written in 1753, so some slightly antiquated Portuguese language stuff in there. So I did have to study some old words and whatnot. But anyway, I just took my time and just made sure I had this thing uh, very, very locked down. And honestly, the transcription might have been harder than the translation because it's it's all handwritten, obviously. And there are parts of it that are pretty difficult to read, but you spend enough time with it and you get used to how it looks. You, you get a feel for it. Anyway, so I was able to transcribe and very accurately, especially by comparison to any other existing works, very accurately translate what this document says. Um, okay, now on to the uh, the content. Um, this document, you know what? Do you one better? I'll pull it up. Okay, so here you have the transcription. Uh, here's the foreword that I mentioned. Um, you know, uh, ellipses are in place of anything that was decayed or, or, uh, destroyed. So anyway, uh, full transcription, and then I'll take you down to the English translation. Um, okay. So the author's actual handwritten letter begins right here. And I'll give a scroll through this real quick so that anyone who wants to pause and read can do so but I'll also provide a Google Drive link for anyone who wants to give this a look. Basically what we're dealing with here is while exploring in what is basically the outback of Eastern Brazil, uh, they come upon like a really distinct mountain range. It's really high and it's kind of like sparkly, they describe it. And they see it at a distance. Um, so they're like, you know what? We got to get to the top of those mountains. Those look real cool. And, you know, it stands out pretty, pretty high from the surrounding area. It's not, you know, just like a, a gently rising slope or low mountains or anything like that. He, he uses a lot of hyperbole to describe it. Anyway, point is, they make their way to the mountains, they find an ascent, and from the peak, they see an expansive city out toward the coast from their perspective. They're about 60 miles inland. Um, so they're like, oh, let's go check out that big city. So they descend the mountain range and they they go near to it, and uh, they they begin to be a little hesitant as they, they come close. It's approaching nightfall and uh they're not sure if they're marching into a friendly city or 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 what exists there so they send a scout ahead the scout comes back and says dude that place is empty so they're like okay so they all walk into the city and uh what they find there is very interesting the they find uh a bunch of two-storied houses like uh uniformly built residences along a main road Oh, first of all, entering the city, they pass through a triple archway with the two side arches being smaller and the middle one being bigger. Very reminiscent of a Roman triumphal arch. They go in, they find all these residences lining the main street. They get to uh, uh, kind of a, a central plaza area and there's a black stone pillar with a statue on top and the statue is of a man with apparently his left hand on his hip and his right hand pointing pointing north is what it says and then it says there are four spires or needles in the style of the romans in in each corner of the plaza one in each corner so there's four spires now um you gotta think he's probably talking about obelisks because obelisks were used throughout imperial rome Though they are not Roman, they are Egyptian, but a lot were carried from Egypt into Rome, and then Rome began to build them later on. Um, so he might have been familiar with them from Roman ruins. Um, but anyway, he says four Roman spires are in this plaza, and then there's a statue with a, a rather pillar with a statue of a guy on top of it. And then elsewhere in the plaza, they find like some relief carvings. And uh, off to one side, there's what appears to be a temple with a lot of figures etched into the wall. 
Now, the city is overall pretty dilapidated, and there's one part of it in particular that is like upheaved, like as if there was an earthquake or something. So they suspect it had been uh, abandoned for quite some time. Anyway, they leave the city, they go and they find like a, a countryside manor elsewhere nearby, and then not far from there, and they, you know, follow a river and not far from there, they they find like some really large mine shafts and they find that there was both silver and gold um, in these mines. Now, in summary, that is what they discovered and described. Now, I'll go back to the document real quick to show you some of the writing they saw carved here and there on, uh, for example, on the archway and buildings and whatnot. So, this is the first example right here. Immediately, you can see like a kappa, a phi, a yota, some Greek letters. And uh, I can't remember if if this one and this one belong to anything in particular. But the ones that stand out the most are the Greek. And throughout here are a few Coptic letters as well, like this one. Um, this here, there are a few others throughout here that when compared to the Coptic alphabet, which I'm less familiar with, um, showed some strong resemblance. Uh, and then there are a bunch of unidentifieds, um, just things that aren't obviously any part of any like very well-known ancient script, or I guess at least known to me. So, so a few mystery letters, few Greek, few Coptic, um, and some that are found in both the Coptic and the Greek, but some that are distinct to each. Um, Anyway, just kind of a hodgepodge alphabet, but they, they find these these characters uh, throughout the city and they and they write down as many of them as they can. Now, this this part right here is included at the very tail end of the letter after he signs off. And this says first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth. And, you know, these little characters corresponding to each. Um, but it's not said directly like what these were copied down from. Um, my thinking is that they might be the figures that were found on the temple wall because he says earlier in the letter that um, there were a lot of, what does he say, crosses and curves or crosses and arcs um, found on the temple wall. Or that that might be what he said, The his use of the word um Corvu is interesting because he says Corvu instead of Corvu, and Corvu means either a crow, like a raven, or much more infrequently is used to describe a corbel, like a uh, architectural corbel. So it, it actually kind of seems like the more likely possibility is that in saying Corvu, he meant to say Corvu which, who knows, I'm not sure that the, the spelling was standardized at this point in time. Even if it was, there are some things that he misspells in this letter. So he's just kind of like hammered it out. He probably meant to say curves, um, which is the word curvo. And uh, if so, then he is describing crosses and curves etched into the uh, wall of the temple. So that might be what's represented right here. Hard to say. Maybe. So him and his field team make this like incredible discovery. And my guess is sometime later when they're far away, he decides he's going to communicate it to his friend. He's at a safe distance and he can send a messenger to his friend with this letter describing what they've found, inviting him to, to follow the messenger to the location and take advantage of like the mine shafts and whatever else might be found in the city. Now, as you can imagine... Uh, the content of this document is regarded very skeptically. For the most part, people think that whoever was writing this letter was creating a fiction that would justify further expansion into the wilds of Brazil, take over more land. And uh, it's not impossible. People made stuff up to justify colonization and, and things before. But I just find it interesting because almost everything that he describes can be tied to a place on the map, in my opinion. Like, I have a location theory based on his description of landmarks and, and things like that. And my theory is detailed in that document. Um, 
the first is the transcription and the translation, then my like analysis and theory. In short, I think it's near the Caparao mountain range in southeastern Brazil, which is part of a national park nowadays. But the author of this letter describes what is basically Roman architecture, uh, Greek and Coptic lettering, um, and just like some really kind of wild stuff that doesn't belong in Brazil. So naturally people think he made it up. I don't think he did. I think the landmarks that he saw can be tied to real places on the map. He described a couple of animal species, one of which is known to be in the area. So it, it really just kind of feels like he was out there looking at real things and actually writing down what he actually saw rather than like making up a discovery, but putting it in a real location where someone could like easily go verify that it's not there. Room for doubt that it's just entirely fictitious is all I'm saying. Now, for reasons that I won't get into entirely, but are very outlined in my analysis, I think that what he was seeing was an abandoned city from the early days of the Roman Empire when Augustus was was the emperor. Um, in fact, I think the statue on top of the pillar is a statue of Augustus. I think it's the Prima Porta style statue and obviously there's the roman triumphal arch and anyway so if that is the case if this is a roman outpost then what the heck about the language right so uh as you know rome was obviously a pretty expansive empire uh, a lot of their holdings were in northern africa and one client kingdom that they oversaw in northern africa was called mauritania now, this is not the same Mauritania that exists today um, in far western Africa. This was a kingdom that encapsulated basically the northern parts of Algeria and Morocco with access to the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, now, the king over Mauritania was a guy named Yuba II. He was an explorer, a naturalist, all these other things, a very educated dude. And he had this fascination with the idea of a westward route to India. It was like one of his goals to map a western route to India. If that sounds familiar, it's because you learned in grade school that this was Christopher Columbus's goal when he uh, sailed westward. Now, Yuba ruled this kingdom in northern Africa, which was a tributary to the Roman Empire, but his people were a hodgepodge of cultures. Roman, probably several Berber groups from northern Africa, very likely some Egyptian people. The point is, he had kind of a crazy melting pot of a kingdom, and one whose language and script at the street level might not have been purely Latin. Now, looking at the letters that were copied down in the manuscript, the best guess that I can make as to like what all came together to create this alphabet is that it is a combination of Greek, Coptic, and maybe some old Libico Berber characters, though it's not a very strong identification on that one. So like other arguments could easily be made. Um, but Yuba was educated in Greek. Cleopatra Selene was educated in Coptic and obviously Libico Berber existed there among the people um, in their kingdom. So what I'm suggesting is that Yuba, whose kingdom sat at the western edge of the Roman Empire and who himself wanted to find India by sailing west. Okay, I'm back. I'm joined by my niece once again. Yes. You remember her? So my thinking is it's possible that Yuba sent an exploration westward into the Atlantic Ocean looking for India, they find themselves subject to the currents and land in South America, and that they might have set up like an outpost city there that became a trading center. Now, I would be tempted to think that they just landed there and were stranded and made this city and paid tribute to their heritage and stuff like that. I'd be tempted to think that and that there wasn't any further communication between the two sides of the Atlantic if not for a discovery made in 1982 by a guy named Robert Marx in the Guanabara Bay. Marx claims to have found while diving 200 Roman amphorae, which are those big clay jars with the two handles and kind of a, a cone-shaped bottom that they used for transporting goods. Like, I think, like, grain and wine and other things. So he apparently found, like, 200 Roman amphorae in a shipwreck, and I'm going to refer to an article I screenshotted a while back. So Marx removed some of the amphorae from the wreck site, 
and took them to Dr. Elizabeth Lighting Will, who is rather was an expert on Roman M4A. I learned that she actually passed in 2009 at 85 years old. Um, according to Dr. Will, they were similar in shape to jars produced in kilns at Kowas on the west coast of Morocco. So Kowas would have been part of the kingdom of Mauritania during Yuba's time. The Institute of Archaeology of the University of London performed thermoluminescence testing on the amphorae and set the jar's manufacture date around 19 BC. So that would have been during the reign of Yuba and originating from kilns that were in Yuba's kingdom and on the far western edge of it, which is which is the likely launching point of whoever it was that landed in South America and eventually built this city. And mind you, this is a separate discovery altogether, unrelated, unrelated to Manuscript 512, this uh, dive, which resulted in the finding of these m 4 a There's a totally unrelated thing, but seems to corroborate it on a couple of points. So I think that needs to be looked further into and published. Um, and I think some legit serious minded field explorations need to happen with manuscript 512 as reference to try to verify or debunk that there may have ever actually been a roman empire outpost in south america because that seems to be the story that that manuscript is telling and that seems to be somewhat backed up by this unrelated discovery of roman amphorae in a shipwreck near Rio de Janeiro, you know, the, the jars of which came from Coas around 19 BC time and place of, of Yuba and all that. So I'll go ahead and link the, uh, Google drive location for my transcription, translation, and analysis. If you want to check that out, I'll also link to the high resolution scans of the manuscript itself. And then lastly, a quick message from this guy to anyone watching. If you have not subscribed to our channel, feel free to do so. Click the like button on this video. If you enjoyed it, leave any thoughts in the comments and turn on notifications. If you would like to be notified when we post something new and lastly, check out our Patreon. If you would like to contribute in another fashion, and that's going to be it for this week. Thank you guys for joining and uh, I'll see you next next week alongside Tom and Josh talking about something else weird. So we'll see you then.